it's uh, my great honor to have a chance to share my idea still in the process of evolving. And hopefully, it will make some sense. And I'm sure it will be very strange to a very large group of people. And some people who are familiar with my way of thinking may consider this uh, rather commonsensical. But in any case, I'll make an effort to come up with a coherent view on spiritual humanism. Also, I will reserve time for question and answer and uh, there some uh, more controversial issues can very well be, uh, be raised. Confucius offered a comprehensive and integrated way of learning to be human. Confucian philosophy takes the concrete living person here and now as its point of departure. One of the most basic Confucian precepts is that learning to be human is to learn to become a person. Becoming a person entails a dynamic process of transformation. A distinctive feature of being human is that despite seeming inevitability of growth, we become persons through learning. We learn to acquaint ourselves with our bodies. Each act of eating, sitting, walking, speaking, or sleeping requires constant learning. Strictly speaking, we do not own our bodies. We become our bodies. Bodies are not givens. They are attainments, indeed amazing achievements. Bodies in all their dimensions, physical, physiological, emotional, psychological, mental, intellectual, and spiritual, define holistically who we are as lived concreteness. We can imagine a concrete person because we have encountered so many of them, from the closest king to casual acquaintances. But uh, here and now, refer to the spatial and temporal reality that we must acknowledge for it is not an imagined possibility, but a presence. How do we deal with a concrete living person here and now? This is a tantamount to our way of being aware of our own existence. Surely, I can imagine that the concrete living person here and now is someone else, but most likely I recognize that it's myself. Others may be aware of my presence occasionally, but I alone, by choice, am always conscious of my presence here and now. The purpose of stating that Confucian philosophy takes the concrete living person here and now as its point of departure is to underscore the importance of self-awareness. However, if we believe that Confucius' real concern is what sort of human beings we ought to become so we can be useful to society. Indeed, social harmony depends upon the persons that uh, we are all learned to become. Real human beings are those humans who have learned to become socially desirable and necessary. We may come up with a significantly different understanding of the Confucian project. Namely, human beings are relational, situated, contextualized, and functionally differentiated. Through learning, we assume different social roles. If we play our roles adequately, effectively, and proficiently, we will all contribute to the public good, and hence the well-being of society. On this view, the idea of the concrete living person here and now focusing on the centrality of self-awareness seems too self-centered. It has the tendency to slip into an individualistic trap. A person may become isolated, alienated from the others, and confined to the domain of a privatized ego. The overly psychological reading of the Confucian heart and mind, as in the case of Mencius, 
may have departed from a more balanced Confucian approach to human flourishing. The quest for the inner self at the expense of social engagement is an unfortunate outcome. According to this line of thinking, Xunzi's insistence upon the discipline of external constraints through ritual and law is an appropriate corrective. I'm not going to burden you with the diverging trends of self-cultivation thought in Confucian tradition. My option to follow Mencius' articulation of the essential difference between human nature and animal nature in general is to establish a solid basis for the primacy of self-awareness. I fully acknowledge that there is rich resource in Xunzi's conception of the mind and that his admonishing on learning is shared by Mencius. Xunzi's theory on human nature is on the surface in conflict with Mencius' broad vision that moral feelings are innate, but there are many points of convergence between the two positions. Mencius and Xunzi both had faith in the perfectibility of human nature, the transformative power of learning, the efficacy of self-cultivation, the tradition of the sages, the good governance through ritual propriety. They both believe that human beings are never static structures, but always dynamic and creative processes of becoming. Why the insistence on self-awareness as a point of departure then. We can certainly come up with the coherent view that other regard takes precedence over self-regard. It is because we are aware of others that we become aware of ourselves. Without acknowledging the existence of others, I may not be aware that I exist at all. It is conceivable that my relationship to the others is prior to my self-awareness. There are numerous examples in the Confucian tradition that, can cite, that we can cite to support this view. The value of filial piety, the obligation of the child to the parent, is central to humanity, precisely because the love that flows from the parent to the child is natural. We learn the value of reciprocity through learning to acknowledge our indebtedness. As we grow up, we are increasingly aware how much other regarding thought and action we ought to have cultivated to show our gratitude. And suddenly, for some of us, it is too late. A person is a central relationship. It's not possible to conceive of a center as totally isolated from its relationships. They give color, sound, sight, and texture to that center as a concrete living person. The lived concreteness of a person, necessarily unique, involves ethnicity, gender, language, age, place of birth, social class, and faith, not to mention personality traits. Each of them symbolizes an extensive social network encompassing thousands and thousands of people. Each one of them is meaningful to me in varying degrees of intensity based on circumstances. Self-awareness does not mean to suggest that we are aware of all these distinctive features as we evolve around all our relationships. Rather, it enables us to remain centered without falling into the disarray of total disintegration and fragmentation. It gives us a sense of direction, a point of orientation. It is a compass that helps us to navigate on troubled waters. This may have been the reason that Confucius urged us to learn for the sake of the self. Learning ordinarily means the acquisition of knowledge or the internalization of skills. Knowledge and skills can be understood as learning for the sake of the self, but what Confucius had in mind is significantly different. What, the what he proposed is the knowledge and skills that can transform us from becoming an integral part of our body. For the sake of convenience, I would like to define learning for the sake of the self as, quote, embodied learning. 
Let us take the example of learning as skill, as an illustration. If we learn to play a musical instrument, say the violin, we need to invest a great deal of time to familiarize ourselves with the bow and fingering so we can produce relatively pleasing sounds. If we are talented and totally committed to the audio's task of becoming a musician, we would then devote our life to it. If we become a virtuoso, the violin, so to speak, is an extension of our body. We no longer play the violin as an instrument, but expresses our in artistic sensibility through it. In short, we have embodied knowledge of the violin. This is, of course, an exceptional case, and only a handful of great musicians can attain it. However, if we can imagine that the instrument we are supposed to learn to play is not the violin, but ourselves, our bodies holistically comprehended. Learning for the sake of the self is vitally important because our whole life is at stake. The question is not simply what career I would like to have, how successful I want to become, how I plan to realize my ambition, what kind of social role would will be most satisfactory, or how I can be rich and famous. Rather, given that I am a concrete living person here now, the question is what kind of human being I would like to become. Self-awareness, so understood, involves knowledge and skill to be sure, but it is primarily a transformative act rooted in our primordial awareness of humanity. The uniqueness of being human reveals itself at this level in its pristine form with brilliance and warmth. This is what man should refer to as the gray body. The famous story about evoking a sense of commiseration upon witnessing a child is about to fall into the well is worth noting here. It may give the impression that we must be shocked to realize that we are all endowed with a feeling of commiseration or sympathy, empathy, and compassion. The real message is that it is so common that if we are incapable of feeling it, they are no, we are no longer human. Learning for the sake of the self is character building. It is totally compatible with our professional aspiration, our quest for excellence, our drive to improve our lots, our willingness to contribute to social harmony, and our desire to be recognized and live a comfortable life. However, it addresses a more fundamental dimension of our existence, the meaning of life. Implicit in the idea of the self as a center of relationships is subjectivity. It is critical that we do not reduce the center to relationships. A concrete living person is made of multi-dimensional complex of relationships. Putting them all together, they cannot fully constitute a person. We should always take into consideration all the primordial ties, I already mentioned race, gender, language, and so forth. Neither can the center of the self be established by them. They are all relevant and significant. Each of them is both a constraint and an enabler. They are all enabling constraints. This requires an explanation. A distinctive feature of Confucian humanism is the recognition that we are all fated to be a particular person. All our primordial ties are, in a sense, given. With the determination, we may be able to alter some of them, such as gender and language. But by and large, they are determined. In many great religious traditions, this fact of life is considered at least constraining. They restrict uh, our choice and freedom of action. We hope to change them, if not to get rid of them. Or at the least, we are instructed to liberate ourselves from these constraints. Some instructions are enforced relatively. In the Christian tradition, adherence to the real fellowship of faith should take precedence over family attachments. Others are highly restrictive. Buddhist monks are often asked to sever all family relationships. The Confucian choice is quite different. 
the fact that we are all fated to be a particular person should be accepted and fully acknowledged. It may not be a blessing, but it calls for positive recognition and even celebration. The perceived constraints are at the same time vehicles for instruments or instruments for self-realization. Therefore, they are not simply constraints, but enablers as well. In fact, it's these, it, uh, these enabling constraints that make us concrete living persons. Confucian self-cultivation is a matter of substantially transforming constraints into enablers through personal effort. I published a few essays exploring the epistemological, ethical, aesthetic, and religious implications of self-cultivation as a mode of knowing. I coined a Chinese term to convey this widely used and yet rarely analyzed idea in traditional Chinese culture. Ti zhi, ti, shen ti de ti, zhi, zhi dao de zhi, embodied knowing. It is neither knowing that nor knowing how, but a third type of knowing which is necessarily a transformative act. Put figuratively, this knowing involves not only the brain and mind, but also the body in a holistic and integrated sense. Bodily engagement as well as the cognitive function of the mind and an affective response of the heart is required. Among the sports, Confucius singled out archery as an example. If we miss the mark, we need to adjust our physical position and mental state here and now. To learn the art of archery, our sense of presence is a prerequisite. Self-awareness is essential for the kind of learning that Confucius recommended. Through self-reflection, self-examination, self-criticism, self-admonishment, and self-encouragement, we establish ourselves as essential relationships. This selfhood, diametrically opposed to the private ego, is open, dynamic, creative, and transforming. It is forever open to the outside, dynamically interacting with people, creatively engaging in all things, and transforming the world around by transforming itself. As Mencius' great body specifies, the myriad things are already equipped in me. This is not an imagined possibility, but an achieved or achievable state. We can expand our vital energy to enable it to fill the space between heaven and earth. Specific physical disciplines such as breathing technique may have been involved, but Mencius avowed that he was able to do it through moral and spiritual exercise. This is not a figure of speech, but from his point of view, an experienced reality. This reminds us of the 12th century Confucian thinker, Lu Xiangshan, who said that he got the gist of Confucian learning himself by reading Mencius. The message from Mencius is precisely the idea of human greatness. This idea was so much embodied in Xiangshan that he could not approach it as a hypothesis to be argued for or to be proved. It simply manifested itself from within. And as he believed it, it should be self-evident to every concrete living person here and now. The anecdote requires an explanation. Lu Xiangshan often referred to Mencius' instruction to establish that which is great in us when he was asked about learning to be human. He repeated the statement so often that his critics queried that if Master Lu had any other important message to convey, Xiang San responded bluntly that there's no other more important message to offer than to establish that which is great in us. Xiang San is noted for his commitment to the mentioning line of thinking. He made it explicit that his uh, experiential understanding of Mencius did not come from any other source than reading the Mencius and that he got it himself. To him, reading Mencius is not to read an ancient text to understand through interpretation the textual meaning what, or what the master 
meant to say. Rather, it is a living encounter with Mencius in person who utter these words to him personally and directly. This kind of utterance sounds like a religious injunction that is not subject to discussion, debate, or verification. That which is great in us is available to every human being. There's greatness in each of us. All we need to do is to establish it. There is no other condition than our willingness to do so. No external forces whatsoever, political, social, or cultural, can prevent us from establishing that which is great in us. Nor can we rely on anything else to establish the greatness in us. Underlying this assertion is the conviction that each one of us, not just the human species in its entirety, is great. The first order of business for every concrete living person is to establish that which is already in us. In other words, learning to be human is to realize the greatness within by establishing it ourselves. It seems on the surface that the injunction is not a factual statement nor a proposition, but an encouragement. Strictly speaking, however, what Xiang San following Mencius meant to convey was not wishful thinking, but a truth, indeed a reality about being human. The Confucian tradition that Xiang San advocated is widely known as the Xin Xue, learning of the heart. A distinctive feature of this school is the centrality of the heart. It is often rendered as mind as well. Xin, heart and mind, is both cognitive and affective. It can feel, will, sense, and know. The feeling, willing, sensing, and knowing capacities of the heart provide the basis for the great body. The first order of business for self-realization is to be aware of the activities of the heart to establish the great body, to underscore the uniqueness of being human. The initial step that is to awaken the heart to make it sensitive to the world around us. The feeling that can be aroused by stimuli from the outside are only superficial manifestation of the sensitivity of the heart. Xiang San's learning of the heart is to have access to the original heart, but Xin, underlying the great body. Strictly speaking, the original heart defines what human nature really is. Human nature, in turn, expresses itself through the vitality and dynamism of the original heart. It is not only an idea, but an activity. It feels, wills, senses, and knows in connection with an ever-expanding network of relationships. It is relational, and its potential for connectivity is unlimited. But there is always a core, a center, that cannot be reduced to its connections, no matter how extensive they are. The original heart, as the core of humanity, is the culmination of the evolutionary process. It is not a static structure, but a continuously becoming activity. In this sense, human beings should not be conceived as being but becoming. Human beings, as becoming, are ceaselessly evolving. This has cosmological as well as anthropological significance. Implicit in this reasoning is the ontological vision of the continuity of being. In this vision, the human relates to all modalities of being, minerals, plants, and animals. If we probe deeply to find some linkages, we are part of a continuum. Yet the uniqueness of being human is qualitatively different from all other modalities of being. The defining human characteristics are not reducible to any of the properties that have become constitutive parts of the human condition. This evolutionary perspective is widely shared in Chinese philosophy. An obvious example is found in Xunzi. I quote, water and fire have qi, but are without life. Grasses and trees have life, but are without awareness. Birds and beasts have awareness, but are without yi. Humans have qi and life and awareness, and moreover, they have yi, end of quote. This idea of the human is the combination of rootedness and emergence. 
the distinctiveness of the human is based on a paradox. It is an integral part of the same process that enables water, fire, grass, plants, and, and, and animals to come into being. Yet, as an emerging property, the human is unique. It is not reducible to its constitutive parts. This, of course, is true with life and consciousness, earlier called it awareness. We cannot adequately understand an emerging property by reducing it to the genetic forces that have made it possible. This is not to deny that structurally, it is always intertwined with all the elements that contribute to this form of this existence. In the evolution, so to speak, nothing is lost. The cumulative process that eventually enables the human to emerge is holistic, dynamic, and continuum. In this sense, the continuity, continuity of being does not mean a linear progression but a process of transformation with increasing velocity of coordination, collaboration, and complexification. I will argue that in a subtle way, it is not incompatible with some versions of creationism. The vital energy, qi, that is present at all levels of the evolutionary process is spiritual as well as material. The spirit and matter dichotomy is not applicable here. But by implication, spirituality is embedded in the life world. It is not defined exclusively by reference to the transcendent, let alone radical transcendence. It does, however, involve a transcendental dimension. The sharp contrast between the secular and sacred does not exist. Herbert Fingerat's characterization of Confucius, the secular as sacred, is suggestive, but the dichotomy is problematical. Indeed, all exclusive dichotomies, such as body, mind, mental, physical, flesh, soul, are alien to the Confucian holistic thinking. Take the example of yin yang. They are different, conflictual, and sometimes tension-ridden. But in principle and in practice, they are complementary, more significantly, they are coexistent and mutually infiltrated. There's no yang without yin and no yin without yang. There's always yang in the yin of the yang and so forth. This enables the confusion to see unity in contradiction and to experience the world as both material and spiritual. Life sin, symbolizes the emergence of an entirely different stage of coordination, collaboration, and complexification. In modern biological terms, it is reflected in an adaptive organizational structure. The capacity of uh, meta metabolism, the ability to maintain the homeostasis, the potency of growth, the potentiality of reproduction, and the responsiveness to the environment. We can maintain that between that matter and life, there is continuity. Even uh, this is discontinuity, even rapture. This is a challenge to the continuity of being. But it is at least mitigated by the subtle observation that from the perspective of the vital energy, qi, the idea of that matter itself is inappropriate. Take the example of the stones to the Confucians or Chinese in general, a piece of jade is not necessarily lifeless. This figurative expression does not negate the fundamental difference between life and death, but it is profoundly significant if we, if we reject the notion that all inanimate things are simply that matter. I'm reminded of the heated debate in the drafting of the Earth Charter decades ago, when the representatives of the scientific community eventually were persuaded by the elders of many indigenous traditions to inscribe the, flay, the phrase, the earth is alive, into the final text. In other words, even so-called that matter is not merely materiality devoid of any spirituality. The issue of zi, consciousness and feeling and awareness is much more intriguing. This virtual agreement that animals have feelings, 
Whether or not they have consciousness is controversial. Some animal lovers believe that they, particularly dogs and horses, do. A few veterinarians insisted they also have self-consciousness. Xunzi uses the term yi, rightness, to differentiate humans from other animals. He underscores the cognitive function of the mind, especially its ability to analyze and differentiate as the basis for building stable social organizations. In this lecture, I follow Mencius' line of thinking or inquiry. He makes it explicit that the difference between human nature and animal nature is slight. For example, like animals, the desire for food and sex, survival and reproduction, is inevitably human nature. The uniqueness of being human lies in a totally different magnitude. He does not want us to forget that human beings are animals. His strategy is to view the case on the slight difference. We can say that the slight difference is that human beings are the kind of animal that is capable of self-consciousness of a particular kind. Despite the necessity of food and sex, which are prerequisites for our physical existence, the small body, self-consciousness enables us to realize the full orientation, the full potentiality of humanity, the great body. From the perspective of the continuity of being, the emergences of life and consciousness indicate the trajectory of the advent of the human. One can well imagine that human beings are interconnected not only with the human world, but with all members of the animal kingdom, the life world, the earth, and beyond. This connectedness enables the human to develop a vision of wholeness or holism. There's nothing in the cosmos that is totally irrelevant to the feeding capacity of the heart. Neither a distant star nor a blade of grass, not to mention human affairs, is outside the scope of the sensitivity of the heart. In principle and in practice, its capacity for responding to all things is unlimited. It is not the result of wild imagination, but of immediate recognition that Mencius asserts that all the 10,000 things are there in me. Through the Manchin spirit, Cheng Hao, and later Wang Yangming, maintain that humanity forms one body with heaven, earth, and the myriad things. They insisted that forming one body with heaven and earth and the myriad things is, the human, is a human capacity realizable by every person in ordinary daily existence. Wang Yangming tried to demonstrate this capacity by a series of il illustrations. Our reactions to a child about to fall into a well, animals trembling with fear before they are slaughtered, trees cut down, and mountains denuded may vary in emotional intensity in evoking our responses, but they all, in diverse ways, affect us. We are conscien consciously or unconsciously connected to family, community, nation, nature, and the cosmos. By implication, he maintained that a full realization of the humanity requires that we overcome not only egoism, nepotism, parochialism, ethnocentrism, and nationalism, but anthropocentrism as well. This move from the concrete to the universal rejects both close particularism, and abstract universalism. The negotiation is between personal rootedness and public spiritedness. The authentic possibility of such a negotiation is predicated on their mutual intelligibility and potential complementarity. To be, person, to be personal is not to be private. While I normally choose not to, to uh, disclose my private thoughts, I often feel impaired to share values that I personally cherish. I'm rooted in my primordial ties, ethnicity, gender, language, place, status, age, and faith, but I have no difficulty in recognizing it, that they are contextualized and historicized to the extent they, are, they represent a unique configuration that defines in the concrete my own singularity. 
However, my self-understanding dictates that I appreciate what I am in the broad social, gender, linguistic, economic, political, social, cultural, and religious contexts. This enables me to know that there are other singularities that are equally complex. I know that I can never fully understand the singularity that I recognize as myself, but I know for sure that it is my privilege and responsibility to try to do so. By analogy, I'm aware that numerous singularities like me are in the same boat. This is the human condition that is, re irrelevant, that, that is relevant to all spiritual traditions. The Confucian path, simply put, is that I'm not what I ought to be, and yet I'm aware that I must work through the structure and function of what I am to live up to the highest standard of self-realization. The logic of great learning can be stated as follows. Myself is the point of departure. From the emperor to the common people, each should regard self-cultivation as the root. In concrete terms, self-cultivation is to transcend, privatize self-centeredness in preference for the public good. We may even say that I'm private, my family is public. My family is private, the community is public. The community is private, the nation is public. The nation is private, the global village is public. The global village is private. The cosmos is public. Public spiritness can only be realized through self-cultivation. This move from the rooted private, pi, private ego to the public spirit relational self is open to all human beings. Human greatness lies in the infinite capacity of the human heart to embody the cosmos. This embodiment occurs through dialogical communication. The dialogical mode is a defining characteristic of the Confucian way of life. It is manifested in four inseparable dimensions of Confucian humanism, self, community, nature, and heaven. Only through dialogue can integration of the body and mind, fruitful interaction between the self and community, harmony between humankind and nature, and mutuality or mutual responsiveness between the human heart and mind and the weight of heaven be attained. Dialogical encountering rather than dialectic overcoming enables the refinement and enlargement of the feeling of commiseration, sympathy, empathy, and compassion inherent in all humans to be extended and expanded from the self to family, community, nation, world, nature, and beyond. Learning to be human is for the sake of the self. The dignity, independence, and autonomy of the self are cherished values. Self-knowledge is necessary for political responsibility, social engagement, and cultural sensitivity. Confucius' disciple, Zhen Zi, remarked that an educated person must be broad-minded and resolute, for the burden is heavy and the role is long. He carries humanity as his personal task. How can we say that the burden is not heavy? He ends his journey only with death. How can we say that the road is not long? Mencius used the metaphor of digging a well to convey this sense of uh, precedence of the desire to establish a relationship <coughs> in one's own terms. <coughs> the idea of digging a well is uh, getting it oneself. It's a proper way of learning. Only if we deeply immerse ourselves in self-understanding will we benefit from the flowing stream beneath to enrich our way of life. The ability to accumulate rich poetic, political, social, historical, and metaphysical resources within us 
is the precondition for embodying and ever expanding network or relationships without. Since the Confucian self is never an isolated individual but a dynamic center of relationships, it cannot but interact with other centers through dialogue. The recognition and respect for the other is a point of departure for entering a fruitful relationship. All five basic relationships are reciprocal. The father is compassionate and the son is filial. The ruler is benevolent, the minister is loyal. The older brother is friendly, the younger brother is respectful. Trust among friends and division of labor between husband and wife. The spirit of reciprocity pervades all relationships. The golden rule stated in the negative, do not do unto others what you would not want others to do unto you, is based on the self-awareness that the integrity of the other takes precedence over the desire to establish a relationship in one's own term. The passive injunction must be augmented by a positive charge. In order to establish myself, I must help others to establish themselves. In order to enlarge myself, I must help others to enlarge themselves. This dialogical mode is applied to nature and heaven as well. In the spirit of dialogue, nature is in Thomas Berry's fel felicitous expression of nature is a communion of subjects rather than a collection of objects. Nature so conceived is the Mother Earth, enabling us to survive, grow, and flourish. Similarly, our relationship to heaven is based on mutual responsiveness. In the Confucian perception, heaven is omnipresent and omniscient, but not omnipotent. It may have created all things, but it relies upon human participation to complete the magnificent work. Humans are supposed to appreciate all that the cosmic flow has engendered and to create a peaceful and harmonious abode for themselves and their environment. The dictum that heaven engenders and humans complete suggests that human beings as heaven's partners are co-creators of their universe. By implication, they are also powerful destroyers. An old Chinese proverb says, humans can survive all disasters except man-made catastrophes. The Han Confucian thinker Dong Zhong Su identified three great roots. Heaven is the root of creativity. Earth is the root of nourishment. And human, humanity, is the root of completion. Zhang Zai's Western inscription, a foundational text in Neo-Confucianism, begins with a similar idea. I quote, heaven is my father and earth is my mother. Even such a tiny creature existence as I finds an intimate niche in their midst. That which fills the universe I take as my body and that which directs the universe I take as my nature. All people are my brothers and sisters, and all things are my companions." End of quote. We learn to return to our human nature by discovering our interconnectedness with heaven, earth, and the myriad things. We also learn that our great body is great because of its capacity for, its kind, for this kind of interconnectedness. Mencius maintained that if we fully realize our own hearts and minds, we will know our nature. Through knowing our nature, we will know heaven. He further contended that if we reflected upon ourselves and realized that we are sincere, we are true and authentic to humanity, this is the greatest joy in life. In short, he simply, simply expounded the anthropocosmic vision in Zhongyong, a doctrine of me, which now we know from archaeological finding, it predated Mencius. I quote, only those who are the most sincere, true, or authentic can realize their own nature. If they can realize their own nature, they can realize the nature of things, of others. 
If they can realize the nature of others, they can realize the nature of things. If they can realize the nature of things, they can take part in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth. If they can take part in the transforming and nourishing process of heaven and earth, they can form a trinity with heaven and earth. Heaven, human, earth. End of quote. This is the reason that Confucius stated that humanity can make the way great. The way cannot make the humans great. This, uh, this be construed as a kind of anthropocentric assertion about human hubris. What Confucius believed in is human potential, promise, and responsibility. A salient feature of Confucian humanism, unlike the secular anthropocentric rational humanism of the Enlightenment, is its necessary connection with heaven and nature. Humanism, as Confucius would have it, is neither despirited nor denatured. It is, a, in theory and practice, rooted in the spiritual realm and grounded in the natural world. Our inner sense, innate sense, of being connected in a sympathetic resonance with heaven, earth, and mirror things may very well be the deepest and commonest source for human greatness. The faith in the continuity, indeed the consanguinity of all modality of being in, uh, as an integral part of the human is not only anthropological but cosmological. It has the great ecological implication of making the earth our proper home. The continuity of being in a deeper sense is not merely a horizontal idea. The emergences of life and consciousness, strictly speaking, are not raptures. But they strongly indicate profound transformations evoking a sense of transcendence, at least self-transcendence. This symbolizes that the evolutionary process also entails a vertical trajectory. The sensitivity of the heart has depth as well as breadth. Its all-embracing wholeness is an inherent human capacity. Therefore, the original heart, rather than the consciousness and feeling we share with animals and life we share with plants and grasses, is distinctively human. It is the original heart that makes human beings great and enables us to have the great body. What is the verticality of the evolutionary process? Cheng Hao. I already cited him, confidently asserted that his learning in general was indebted to his predecessors. But the true import of the two characters, Tianyi, heavenly principle, was intimately embodied in him by himself. In other words, Chen Hao experienced the full meaning of the heavenly principle by personally getting it himself. His subjectivity enables him to realize that the heavenly principle in his original heart. It was not revealed to him by an authoritative force from outside. He really got it himself. To him and indeed all the thinkers in the learning of the heart, the heavenly principle is within our nature. This is in perfect accord with the opening statement of the doctrine of Ling, I already cited. Human nature is endowed by heaven. Since human nature is endowed by heaven, the heavenly way, presumably how the heavenly principle functions, is encoded, encoded in human nature. Heaven makes humans human, but humanity ought to be responsive to heaven as well. Having our nature conferred by heaven, it is our obligation to enlarge it. This implies that humans have the capacity and responsibility to bring the way to fruition in the world. The highest manifestation of humanity is cosmological as well as anthropological. In short, it is anthropocosmic, predicated on a holistic and integrated humanism with a very profound reverence for heaven. In the Book of Change, the cosmos is always a dynamic process generating new realities 
by creatively transforming the existing order. The message is for us is that we ought to emulate this heavenly vitality by a continuous effort of self-strengthening. Our reverence for heaven is not a worship of uh, a holy other. It's not worship and authority totally beyond our comprehension, but to express a deep sense of awe for the source of life and creativity in itself. The uniqueness of being human is our inner ability to learn to become worthy partners of the cosmic process. This is predicated on the assumption that we are empowered to comprehend heaven through our self-knowledge. As Mencius avowed, if we can realize the full measure of our heart, we can know our nature. If we know our nature, we know heaven. Understandably, the highest manifestation of self-realization is the unity of heaven and humanity. Yet, we must acknowledge the asymmetry in the heaven-human relationship. Although heaven is creativity in itself, human beings learn to be creative through personal effort. Heaven is, heaven's genuineness is naturally brilliant, whereas human beings struggle to become true to the, themselves by means of self-knowledge uh, and wisdom. But as co-creators, human beings can carry the way in the world on behalf of heaven. They are obligated by their own nature to realize the way in their life world. In so doing, the way is no longer out there as mere transcendence with no intimate relationship to human existence here and now. Rather, it is embodied in the common experience of everyday life, making ordinary people without necessarily being aware of its far-reaching implications, personally connected with heaven. There's transcendent dimension of heaven beyond human comprehension. But heaven is also imminent in human nature. Mencius articulate this insight. Our body and complexion are given to us by heaven. Only a sage can give his body completion. Thus, the way to sagehood is a process of authenticating our body, our mind, our soul, our spirit, are all embodied in the deep structure of ourselves. They are refined manifestations of selfhood because they radiate from the core of our nature, which is inherent in our body. In other words, the human body is a microcosm of the cosmos. Through the cultivation of the heart, the body can open itself to the world and the entire cosmos. This is succinctly captured by Wang Yangming in his brilliant comprehension of Mencius' idea of Liangzi, primordial awareness. This primordial awareness is precisely what Lu Xiangshan identified as the original heart. They all took it for granted that it is the greatness of being human and the potential expensiveness of human nature. To the learners of the heart, Primordial awareness is embodied knowledge. It is both cognition and affection. It is feeding with intrinsic reasonableness. It is knowing that entails a transformative act. The activity involves three trajectories. It purifies the quality of the body. It affects the world, and it fulfills the heavenly decree. The self-discovery and self-conscious activation of primordial awareness calls for joy and celebration. All humans at the moment exhibit sageliness. To say that people in the street are all sages, as several, several of Wyoming's followers were fond of saying, is an encouragement. We should all learn to emulate the sages. And an ontological truth, all human beings are not only potentially but really sages. At the same time, it is easily understandable that every person, Confucius included, always falls short of attending sagehood. Existentially, Confucius made it explicit that he was far from being able to attend it. Therefore, learning to be human requires a ceaseless process of self-cultivation. 
in light of the discussion of human greatness, heavenly principle, and primordial awareness, I would like to e reiterate the centrality of subjectivity in Confucian humanism. While it seems reasonable to define Confucianism as a form of social ethics, it is vitally important not to reduce subjectivity to a set of social roles. One can argue that human relationships is implicit in Confucian subjectivity, that without the social dimension, the distinctiveness of Confucian subjectivity is lost. Indeed, the Confucian person is always enriched by connectivity. We learn from the thesis the continuity of being, that forming one body with heaven and earth and mirror things is not only an imagined ideal, but an experienced reality. It is not through rational calculation or empirical proof that we know it is true. It is through a profound feeling embodied in our original heart that we know intimately and immediately that it is so. The feeling so conceived is not separable from ordinary feelings and emotions such as joy, anger, sadness, and happiness, yet it is fundamentally different because it is a constitutive part of our humanity. It expresses itself specifically as empathy, sympathy, compassion, or in mentioned term, commiseration. It is the very reason that human beings are great for it evokes the great body in us. Of course, this feeling is not simply anthropological. This uh, anthropocosmic feeling, to e reiterate Cheng Hao's reference to the heavenly principle, his ecstasy, ecstasy of experiencing it through intimate embodiment suggests a personal realization of the transcendent reality. He got it himself because it had always been latent in his original heart. We can imagine that for Cheng Hao, it is precisely the embodied knowledge of the heavenly principle that enable him to articulate the conviction. Humanity so conceived is awareness. It is an internally generated awareness. It may be re uh, a response to an external stimulus, but it is not merely the consequence of an outside force. It has its own autonomous and independent agency. Unlike ordinary feelings, it is not merely passively responding, but also actively probing. However, it does not function at the empirical level alone. Its connectivity is all embracing. It connects by making contacts and forming linkages. In a deeper sense, it connects by participation and transformation. It is a cognitive function to be sure, but it is also affective. Indeed, in all our bodily sensations, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, and touching, are all both cognitive and affective. Humanity as a wellness, in the case of sympathy, for example, is a transformative act. It is knowledge and at the same time action. The spontaneity in which it expresses itself makes action an integral part of knowledge. Unlike ordinary sensations, it naturally emanates from the heart without reflection or intention. It is empirical and transcendental. We can experience it as ordinary sensation, but we cannot sense its depth and breadth at that level. We should recognize that our original heart defines our true nature. It is, of course, the quality that we are born with, but more importantly, it is conferred by heaven. As the opening statement of the Zhong Yong specify that human nature is decreed by heaven. In other words, the original heart, our true nature, is where the heavenly principle resides. The heavenly principle is omnipresent. It is present in humans, animals, plants, and rocks. Indeed, all beings in the evolutionary process. It is the ultimate reason for their existence. However, Cheng Hao's personal experience of embodying the heavenly principle is significant in two senses. 
It is a vision of humanity that it is a confirmation of subjectivity. Humanity, as Cheng Hao envisioned it, is not merely an idea but an activity, dynamic, transformative, and productive. It is how the heavenly principle functions in human life. Its dynamism is ceaseless. It is always in the process of becoming. It displays tremendous transformative potency like the power of growth in nature. It produces and reproduces with inexhaustible inner strength. As an activity, humanity expresses itself in feelings, especially sympathy, empathy, and compassion, and of course, commiseration. In short, a feeling of love. There are several attempts to define more precisely the meaning of love in this connection. A prevalent position is to love people or to love others. The etymology of Ren, Professor Hans Link talked about it yesterday, humanity containing the graph of two certainly lends strong support to this reading. The eminent Berkeley sinologist Peter Bupper strongly argues that the proper translation of Ren should be co-humanity. However, I prefer the rendering of Ren in the recently discovered bamboo strips from Odin, body on top and heart below, indicating the inseparability of body and heart. I do not wish to enter an elaborate philological debate here. Suffice it now to point out that the two different readings have profound philosophical implications. If Ren is rendered as co-humanity, human relatedness is a, <coughs> constitutive, a constitutive element, and sociality is an integral part of humanity. If humanity is made of body and heart, we can well conceive of it as individuality. Indeed, singularity. According to this reading, the primacy of love can very well be self-love, which may serve as the basis for making others love me and loving others. This actually is precisely an order of priority Confucius preferred as cited by Xunzi. Self-love takes precedence over loving others, which takes precedence over making others love me. What is wrong with defining humanity in social terms alone? I can appreciate the effort to define humanity in social terms, but the danger of defining humanity exclusively in social terms is to miss an essential feature of the Confucian project of learning to be human. Let me continue with this discussion on love. Confucian humanity expresses itself in differentiated rather than undifferentiated love. In family ethics, the practice of humanity must begin from parents and expand outward. This is true with sympathy, empathy, and compassion. The sequence is not arbitrary, but the pattern is established as a practical guide. The parent-child relationship is often cited to show the centrality of the family in Confucian ethics. Filial love is the first step in cultivating it. By emphasizing family relations, the rectification of names dictates let fathers be fathers and let sons be sons. In concrete terms, the teaching of filial piety is to instruct the son to behave as son towards his father. This requires that the son is aware of his role as a son. This awareness precedes the son's ability to perform his role properly. If he is willing to obey his father or to submit himself passively to the orders of the father without being critically aware of what a proper father-son relationship ought to be, he has already abandoned his responsibility as a son. Therefore, Confucius was furious when Zhen Zi asked him, how about following the orders of the father? Confucius stated that the son of heaven is surrounded by, surrounded with uh, seven senses, 
a law with five and a sub-law with three. Their sole responsibility is to remonstrate with their rulers. If the son does not remonstrate with the father, he is abdicating his duty as a son. This is tantamount to setting a trap for his father to fall into the unfatherly behavior. Obeying the father blindly is diametrically opposed to filial love. Underlying the reasoning is that the son's self-cultivation demands that he is aware of his obligation to see to it that his father behaves in a fatherly way. The father-son relationship is mutually beneficial. The centrality of self-awareness is obvious. Humanity is also communication. I've already mentioned that humanity's connectivity is positive engagement and active transformation. It communicates not as an outside observer, but as an inside participant. Implicit in subjectivity is also intersubjectivity or intrasubjectivity. The recognition of the other is not an imposition of my self on the other, nor is it an appropriation of the other into my selfhood. The other is not only tolerated or recognized, but also respected. The integrity of the other cannot be compromised, even if I strongly believe what I do is for his benefit or her benefit. I need to first understand his or her wishes as a precondition to persuade him or her to follow my way. I do not prematurely do to him or her what I hope that he or she will do to me. It is after I have fully appreciated his or her situation that I begin to interact with him or her positively. This may sound therapeutic in a doctor-patient relationship, but the ethical reason is considerableness. The golden rule stated in the negative precedes the active charge doing unto others what you want others to do unto you. Observing the rule, do not, unto, do not do unto others what you would not want others to do unto you, may avoid a necessary clash of faiths. Interfaith dialogue challenges conversion as the only purpose of missionary work. This does not mean that one is, one is no longer obligated to share the good news. It merely recommends more expedient way or skillful means to convey the message. The crucial point is that the interest of the other is already in my self-awareness. Humanity as awareness assumes a transcendent significance. Since we are inseparable and holistically interconnected with all things, we find a common source. It is not the objective reality of the common source alone, but the human awareness and capacity of participating in it that enable us to assert greatness of human beings. Subjectivity is critical in this connection. No relationship can generate the light and warmth of self-awareness. Every form of vital energy that makes a thing embodies a principle. All principles emanate from the heavenly principle. They are endowed with the original heart. It is in perfect accord with the Mencius claim that all myriad things are equipped in me. His following statement that the greatest joy in life is that upon reflection, I find that I'm true to myself, can thus be interpreted to imply that ultimate happiness is the realization that I'm an authentic human being forming one body with heaven and earth and myriad things. We should add that there is subtlety in this seemingly thorough monism, namely oneness of principle and multiplicity of its manifestation. For example, humanity as universal love should be encouraged, but the actual practice, different, uh, actually practice differentiated love because it's practicality. Beginning with the closest kin and extending outward is an appropriate method of realizing in 
uh, humanity in family, community, nation, and beyond. From the perspective of spiritual humanism, each human being, as endowed by the heavenly decree, is intrinsically free, equal, and valuable to realize that which is great in us. Our dignity is guaranteed by our subjectivity. It is our noble mission to cherish our individuality or singularity. No outside authority should or can take the original heart, heavenly principle, or primordial awareness from us. To quote, the authority of the commander of the three armies can be taken away, but the will of a commoner cannot be taken away. An equally crucial pre premise in spiritual humanism is sanctity of the earth. Our universe is saturated with intrinsic value and numinous beauty. This reality cannot be proved by empirical data, nor can it be grasped by deductive logic or reductive logic from natural sciences, such as uh, neurobiology. Rather, it is a commitment, indeed a faith, which may or may not be theistic. The critical issue is to recognize that it has taken billions of years with fine tuning of all the elements, air, water, soil, and numerous other factors for us to emerge for so brief a moment. We can dismiss the whole story as senseless. We can follow major and minor creation stories to accept the thesis that there is teleology in our existence. Of course, there are numerous other options. The ontotheological idea underlines Spinoza's philosophy, which was a source of inspiration for Einstein, seems to be an excellent candidate for articulating such an idea. Also, Portillic and Carsagan, as mentioned by Ron Dworkin, also supported this thesis that we should have faith in the, quote, objective reality that there is meaning in life and that nature has intrinsic value. However, I do not accept his outright rejection of materialism and naturalism. And I am strongly opposed to his anti-theistic position. I agreed with Ron Osborne that the ontotheology, as Dworkin talked about, lacks deeply humanizing community or life-sustaining joy, even though it has decorum and dignity. The grammar of theism strikes a sympathetic resonance in spiritual humanism. Sacred places, cathedrals, churches, temples, mosques, synagogues, hymns, songs, prayers, dances, festivals are beyond pretensions to scientific, philosophical, or theological control. All three great theistic religions have spiritual resources and intellectual depth to inspire us to sing songs of hope and express our gratitude to divine love. They have made profound contributions to human religiosity. Nevertheless, spiritual humanism may be theistic or pantheistic, and it embraces atheism and a variety of vitalism characteristic of most indigenous traditions as well. It differs from monotheistic religions in several essential ways. It takes the sanctity of the earth for granted. It subscribes to the idea of the continuity of being. By implication, it does not believe in radical transcendence, such as the holy other, which alone is the numinous, the numinous in Otto, uh, Rudolf Otto's sense. To quote Fingeret's uh, fel felicitous phrase again, the secular are sacred. In other words, the life world is intrinsically meaningful. It is where the ultimate meaning of life is realizable and ought to be realized. To a spiritual humanist, a humanist we are rooted in earth and community, especially the family. Our body is the proper home for our mind, soul, and spirit. We learn to be fully human through earth, community, and body. Our spiritual transformation is not a departure from where we are, 
but a journey to the interiority of our being. Paradoxically, the innermost core of being, the source of our self-knowledge, is none other than the macrocosm or macrocosmic reality ingrained in our existence. Surely, earth, community, and body constrain us. They shape us into concrete forms. We are inescapably earthly, earthly, communal, and bodily. Hitherto, spiritual traditions in general have instructed us to free ourselves from these constraints. A great human aspiration is to be liberated from mundane bondage, to escape from the prison house of the soul. In spiritual humanism, these are enabling constraints, the vehicles that carry us forward to our destiny. They are instrumental in offering each of us the unique path of self-realization. Without them, we cannot exist in any concrete sense. They are our incarnations. A human being so conceived is not a creature, but an active agent in the cosmic transformation as an observer, participant, indeed co-creator. Even though they may be a, create, a creator, the creativity since the Big Bang has never been lost, but accumulated, accumulated in every segment of the evolutionary story, sun, earth, life, animal, and human. We are the inheritors of this cosmic energy. We are charged with the responsibility to see to it that what has been endowed in our nature continues to give generative power to new realities and life forms. Spiritual humanism believe that human life as transcendent has transcendent meaning, that there is always mystery to be comprehended, and that theism, as well as other manifestations of human religiosity, teach us to rise above secular, secularism. We are finite beings, but in our finitude, there is a constant presence of infinite divinity. Spiritual humanism is a faith in humanity. The task of learning to be fully human is to form one body with heaven, earth, and mirror things, for there's intrinsic unity between immanence and transcendence. Thank you for your patience.